Hi everyone and welcome to week nine. This week we're going to be talking more about joining multiple tables. We're going to be talking about some resources for continuing to learn SQL, some query options that are not based on SQL, and we're going to start talking about what UI UX is and why it's important. So the first thing that we want to talk about is why we have so many table joins. So you remember from last week that all of the data in a database is organized into a table or multiple tables. These tables will have different relationships. The results of these different joins will show different combinations of data. The type of join that we're going to pick is going to depend on the type of problem we want to solve. Queries are asking the database different questions and the results that we get are going to depend on the relationship between the different tables. So let's look at, a, at an example that might help. Let's say, for example, we have a reading campaign. So we are continuing with the books example. So if we have a reading campaign, we might have a table of library patrons who signed up for the campaign. We might have a table of books who were checked out from the campaign. And then we would do an inner join on them to see the winner of the campaign by ordering the results by descending. So the specific example query would say, I want to select patrons.name, so the name of the patron, so the patrons table and the name column. Um, and from the patrons table, I want to do an inner join of campaign checkouts on patrons.patronid, so the patrons table, patron ID is going to be one of the columns in our table. And that is going to be equal to the campaign checkouts.patron. So this is where we're basically saying like from the patrons table, we have all of the library patrons who signed up and uh, the books that they've checked out. And I want to group by patrons.name and order by count descending. So this is going to give us all of the patron names for who signed up for our campaign. And we are going to order this by descending so we can see who checked out the most books, assuming that if you checked out the book, you read them, so that we can see who's the winner. Give them a congratulations. Now, um, when we talk about the different types of joins, there's a whole bunch of different ways that we can look at this. I have some visual examples, if that's helpful for you. So these Venn diagrams, um, you can see that on the left, the SQL joins have some example uh, Venn diagrams, and then they have the SQL command below them. There's also the example on the right, which has the different types of joins using the Venn diagrams, the SQL commands, and then the tables. So let's say, for example, we wanted to look at an inner join. So if we have an inner join, then we are looking at anything that matches on table A and table B. But this is only going to be what matches. So we're going to select the select list from table A and do an inner join on table B on A key and B key. So we can see that that example on the left is going to be the SQL command. We can also see if we look at the example on the right, it's going to be in this case, instead of table A and table B, it's user table and order table. So if the user table is uh, Bob, Allison, Carrie, and then we have user IDs and order IDs, you can see that the user ID um, and the order ID and the username. So we're looking at the user table, doing an inner join on the order table. And we look like we are matching up the user ID and the order ID so that we can see who's going to be our match. Um, and it looks like our result is Bob. Bob is our one or two matches. Bob has two orders. 
So the different types of joins will get us different information. So let's say, for example, um, we were looking at a left join. So that's going to be the user table and anything that matches on the order table. So in that case, we'd have our user ID and username our user ID and order ID table. And then we would select everything from user table, do a left join with the order table on the user ID from the A table and the user ID from the B table. And we can see that we have results, except Carrie actually has, it looks like a null result. So that was filled in. Um, so we can see that that's how the left join is put together and what the example SQL query would be for a left join. Now, if this is confusing, please do not feel like, oh no, this is never going to make sense. The different types of joins take a whole bunch of different practice and I am going to have some resources for you so that you'll be able to see some more examples. I'm about to talk about them a little bit more as well. Um, and it is a kind of a complex topic. So we'll look at the inner join. So if we know that our tables have columns of information, you need to know the names of the columns so you can figure out the match. So one of the things that is important to know about our database and the tables in our database is the names of the different columns so that you know what the match is going to be, what's the primary key, what's the foreign key, and how is our data organized. That right there is one of the reasons that you'll sometimes see people get very picky about having a database diagram schema, like how that database is organized and having that in the documentation somewhere. Um, because being able to know the name of the table, the name of the column, or the name of the columns um, is how we're able to write our queries. And if we don't have that noted in the documentation, we can't write our queries. So the inner join is where the information on tables A and B match, but only looking at a particular column, and it's only where they match. So that means we are only looking at the column name in tables A and B, called name in this particular case. So if we wanted to know patrons of the library who borrowed books in the last six months, we would look at the patrons table and the books checkout table, and we can see that example from slide one. So that's... Uh, going to be similar. So you can see that the table A and table B, only where they match, the command would look like select everything or splat from table A, inner join table B. So that's going to be naming the two tables that we're doing the inner join on. And then we're going to say on, and then it's table A dot name equals table B dot name. And that's where we're going to specify both the table name and the column that we're trying to match. So in this case, it's table A and table B. And in both cases, the column is going to be named. So that's why they're both dot name. So that match is how we're able to figure out where those two tables will overlap and get just those results. Whereas an outer join is going to be everything, everything from both tables. So if these tables have all of our columns of information, the outer join is all of the information on both tables, including where they match. <coughs> Sorry. In this case, we are looking at the column name in both tables A and B again. <coughs> Sorry. This is less common than inner joins, just so that you know. The reason that this is less common is because this is uh, an overload of information. An inner join where we have everything that is matching, but only what is matching is going to give us way less information than everything on both tables. So in this case, a uh, use case example, we can take the books table and the patrons table, and we want to look at bo both. Not all books have been checked out, not all patrons have borrowed a book, but we want all of that data anyway. Anything that isn't filled in when we look at all of this data will have that null value. So you could see from the previous one where we had that null filled in, it's because it was in one of the tables, but not in the other table, and so it just automatically fills in with null. 
So we would look at select everything from table A, full outer join, table B. So that's I want to see everything in table A and table B. Full outer join means I want to see it all. And this is on table A dot name equals table B dot name. So that's saying which column we're trying to match again. And in this case, they're both called name. And it's table A dot name and table B dot name because both tables are going to have a name column and we're just specifying which table that name column is in. And so we want to look at basically everything. Now another thing that you might see commonly is left and right joins. Left and right joins are going to be another way that we can look at the different pieces of data. I'm going to talk about the example using a left join. However, the exact same thing would be true for a right join. The left join and right join is just going to be referring to the order in which we're talking about the tables. So if we're looking at our tables as table A and table B, and we're writing our commands as select splat or everything from table A, left outer join table B, that's a left join. We could switch it up and we could say select everything from table B right outer join table A. And by switching that and saying right, we can do a right join instead of a left join. Left outer joins is going to be all the results from table A, including where they are matched on table B. A left outer join where we don't include matches is done by using the where to specify that if table A has matches in table B, mark it as null. So you can see the difference in the query. So both queries are going to have select splat or everything from table A, left outer join table B. And you can see that that's the same on both options. Then it's going to have on table A dot name equals table B dot name on both because we're looking at the column name and we're looking at the column name on both tables A and table B. So we're doing this join based off of the column name on our tables A and B. And that column name is how we are saying what the relationship of these two tables are. So if we were doing a full left outer join, we would just leave it here. If we wanted to take out anything that matched on table B, so we don't want to just say, hey, everything on table A, basically. Um, we wanted to say everything on table A that isn't on table B. I would add in where table B dot ID is null. And so adding that in, I am able to say, I don't want to include matches from table A and table B. I want those to be nulled out because if they match, I don't want to see them. Um, so you can also switch, as I said, and you can have this do all of these things on the right instead of on the left. It's just the order in which you're putting your table into your query. Now, again, I would like to reiterate, one of the best ways to learn how to do this is practice it. Um, it's really boring to just sit and have somebody just, you know, sort of say all these to you, whereas when you can actually try it, see it, play with it, troubleshoot it, that usually makes it a lot easier. So I have some examples of places that you can go next. One example is a reference. So the W3Schools actually has a really nice quick reference that you can go to and you can see some different examples of different queries. You can try them out. They have a little thing where you can actually have this try it section and basically all of these will give you the ability to try these queries on small little test databases. That way you can actually do some trials and some practice. 
I have also included some cheat sheets in here. So these different cheat sheets will allow you to have a quick reference so that once you are more comfortable, you can go back and say like, oh yeah, I just need to refresh on this thing or that thing. The first time you learn something is usually the hardest when you just need to remember something that you've learned. It's usually a lot easier. So sometimes the cheat sheets can help with that. Now, the last thing that I'm going to recommend is some challenges and case studies. And the reason that I would recommend these challenges and case studies is because in some of these cases, I, I guess I would call it the training wheels have come off. So for a lot of the different practice that I've linked, um, both on my website or Blackboard if you're in my class, um, there's not just here's, uh, you know, what I want you to do. It's also, are you stuck? Do you need help? Do you need a hint? What's the answer? And there's those uh, guards in place so that if you get really confused as you're doing it, you sort of have that resource of, well, I didn't really know how to do it, but I was able to, you know, get the answer and I can kind of work backwards from the answer. However, that can sometimes mean that you get, I guess, a little bit complacent. And so having challenges where there is not the possibility of having the answer can give you a better idea of where your skill set is laying. So I've linked here the eight week SQL challenge. I linked the first case study, but there's actually eight case studies. Um, I thought that this was a good website. I thought the person that put it together did a really interesting job with it. It was a little confusing to see where to actually enter in the SQL queries to do the testing, but um, as you're looking at the case study, the database is explained. And then if you scroll down, you can actually see the schema. There's a link where um, you'll see like these little, I guess, tabs, and you can actually open up a new website where they have the database, um, the schema, and everything all loaded so that you can do some queries and trials on that particular database. Um, and so there's eight case studies there. There's the advanced SQL puzzles where you can try your puzzle solving skills. And then I've also included a link to HackerRank. HackerRank, um, some people will use it as like a practice. That's what I'm suggesting here. Some people will use it as a way to get a job. So, you know, if you can get high enough on the leaderboards, um, sometimes they'll have like, you know, job offers and prizes and stuff. And so I just linked the HackerRank for SQL. All of them are free to use, free to sign up, and um, there's some little puzzles. If you're in my class, you're going to be using HackerRank, but um, you can also just sign up for free and try some of these out. So hopefully that's helpful for you. Now, now that we've spent so much time talking about SQL and relational databases, we are going to talk about NoSQL. NoSQL stands for not only SQL. NoSQL is not a relational database. So we have been doing almost all of our focus on relational databases, as in different tables and how they relate to each other. Non-relational databases, such as NoSQL, are document key value graph or wide column stores. Now, the reason that some people will use NoSQL over SQL and non-relational databases over relational databases, some people, many people would argue that NoSQL is more flexible and scalable. NoSQL can handle unstructured and semi-structured data. So if you go back to some of our early weeks when we were talking about structured versus unstructured data, has the data been organized or not? The ability to store data that has not been organized in any way um, is not something that SQL really handles well. Just like dumping data into a table that isn't organized is not something that's going to make SQL very happy, whereas uh, NoSQL can handle unstructured data a little bit better. Some examples of implementations of NoSQL are uh, MongoDB, Redis, and Cassandra. And you may want to use NoSQL instead of SQL if you're talking about databases of really large items. So like, for example, images or videos or something, you might end up using NoSQL instead of SQL because um, it can handle those large items a little bit better. Um, okay, so next we're going to talk about UI and UX. 
So UI is user interface, UX is user experience. Both of these are topics that can be an entire course or an entire job, an entire like degree. There's a lot of work that people do to go into UI or UX. The way that we interact with software, data, computers is UI and UX. UI is the look and the feel of the interaction. UX is the overall experience. So when we are talking about data and databases and all of this, data, databases, data analytics, all lovely stuff. But if you can't communicate this with anybody else, to be frank, it doesn't matter. Um, you could have the most beautiful data analytics in the entire world. And if you can't effectively share that with anyone, literally does not matter how brilliant it is. Um, look at the state of science communication and I, all science, I include computer science and in, in here. Um, if you can't communicate to others and show others why something is cool, why something is important, why they should pay attention, it doesn't matter how awesome it is. So the ability to have a UI or UX that is good so that people want to use it, want to interact with your data, want to see the results from your database, want to ask you more questions about your data. Um, all of that is absolutely vital because if people don't want to see the results don't understand the results or don't see the importance of the results, no matter what those results are or how they're presented, your work is for naught. And so it's important to pay attention to that. So with UI and UX, it's really about communicating with others. If people don't want to use your software, if people don't want to interact with your data, it, it doesn't matter. Like, it doesn't matter if you have brilliant data. It doesn't matter if it's revolutionary. It doesn't matter how brilliant your analytics are. If everybody tunes you out in three seconds and nobody wants to look at your data and nobody wants to read your report and nobody wants to see the brilliant insights that you've had, you know, it's kind of like if a tree falls in the woods and nobody is there to hear it, it doesn't matter. Um, apologies if you are a philosophy person and I just made you cringe. Um, but if others can't follow what you're doing with your data or with your product, um, if they aren't seeing what you want them to see, it's not going to help. And so if you have, let's say, for example, some absolutely brilliant analytics, but you aren't presenting it in a way that people want to look at it, or you have five points and it turns out you've only presented one of them in a way that people want to pay attention to and your other four get ignored. Um, you know, that's kind of like, well, then what do you do and how do you deal with that? Another thing, whether it is reasonable or not, people tend to judge credibility by usability. If your data is hard to understand, difficult to present, people may not think it's credible. So if you have the most brilliant data collection and analytics in the entire world, but it looks like an absolute mess, people aren't likely to listen. Just like, um, you know, if you show a scrolling field of numbers, like that makes people tune out really quickly. Whereas if you have really good data visualization, which we'll be talking about soon, um, people are much more likely to be like, oh, that's what you meant. And then they are going to pay more attention and see what's happening and, you know, sort of understand it a little bit better. There are other ways that we can communicate our data with others. So we can generate reports of our data. Um, you know, for example, Postgres can generate a CSV for the results of a query so that we can take that CSV. We remember CSVs from previous weeks. Um, comma separated values, we can take those results and send it on somewhere else. Um, query results can also be sent to other programs. Some databases are hooked up to other programs. For example, dashboards are really common where a lot of companies will have these dashboards. Um, I see a lot of web-based dashboards 
And basically the web-based dashboards will allow you to show the results of queries on a website, maybe with, you know, drop down menus and stuff, sort of like pre-programmed in queries that people can look at so that they don't necessarily need to have all of the SQL knowledge for the back end. Um, business intelligence or BI tools can also be used to create data analytics reports. They can have, you know, charts, tables, um, filters, parameters, stuff like that. And those different intelligence tools can allow us to take our data, our database, our results, and um, send it to others in a way that they'll understand. You can also put query results on a website. So like a common example is when you go shopping online, if you do shop online, um, you probably go to, let's say, an unnamed store that's called um, uh, Flamazon. And so this unnamed store that's completely made up called Flamazon, and you wanted to go shop for a new shirt there. So when you actually say, you know, hey, I'd like to go look for a pink shirt on Flamazon, entering it into the search bar is actually querying a database and saying, you know, hey, can you please give me all of the results for pink shirts? And the sort of proprietary algorithm portion is how those results are ordered. So the query is just, hey, show me all of the pink shirts. And then they're going to add in some stuff in the background, like most popular pink shirts or pink shirts from people that have paid me to be higher in the rankings or pink shirts by gender, by size, by, you know, whatever it happens to be. And so stores will use databases to keep track of their inventory. You searching is going to be querying that database and all of that's actually happening in the background. So that's another way that data will, you know, get shared with others so that you can do important things like shop online at Flamazon. Um, but being able to share and communicate our data with other people is actually a really important and vital thing so that everything that we know, we can share with others in a way that they'll be able to understand and follow. So I hope this was helpful and I hope you all have a lovely day.